Hello everyone, Mike Smith here from the brokerage, getting to share some time with our executive vice president, Josh Schlattery. It's always good to visit with you, Josh. I love bantering back and forth on some of these things. And, you know, as we kind of prep for this podcast, and the theme seems to be in 2024, turbulence. Mm -hmm. And anytime I've been involved with a turbulent market, it seems like on the backside of that, we end up coming out better off. So I think the theme here for this podcast might be turbulence breeds activity and activity breeds enrollments. Anything you got to say about that? Buckle up. You know, it's been an interesting summer and I think it's just time that we kind of share some of these updates as we're here mid-season through the carrier rollouts and turbulence is a perfect word. Yeah. Well, not only that, but now we've got an election year, a political season in front of us. So... Uh, some of the things that I want to try to help prep our listeners for in this AEP is what to expect, what the cadence might be this year in an election year versus a, a non-election year. Any advice on how they might want to treat the beginning of the AEP? What activities should they anticipate versus after the election and how that might change? Yeah, every, every election year presents a, a marketing dilemma, and that's that, you know, the the, the political ads are going to dominate the media space pretty much for a good chunk of, of the latter half of October and then into November. So from October 15th to December 7th, a lot of times we see the carriers take a pause on marketing. They, they market heavily in the first couple weeks of AEP and then they save a lot of that spend for after the 7th because the political ads aren't airing as much. Also with direct mail, we see that you know bulk mail especially does not get priority. So you may be waiting an extra week. We've even seen two, three weeks delay in an election year on direct mail. So hmm. my advice would be make sure if you are going to do direct mail prior to the election, get it out early. And if you can mail first class, that's the, the best way. But then also this year we've got retention is kind of this theme, right? We know that we've got to get in front of our members, but also we have all of these shoppers that are going to be out there. So how do we capitalize on getting in front of our members while that election kind of lag is going on with advertising and then really focus on attacking new business after the 7th? So the takeaway there is to have a database, somehow manage your information, get in touch early with your current membership, let them know about some of the changes, remind them about their annual notice of change or ANOC letter, mm -hmm. and really try to get those commitments before, say, October 15th. That first two weeks of October, really focus in on retention. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, absolutely. Use that first, you know, section to uh, get in front of your members. Anox hit in September. That's going to be the time when your phone will likely be ringing. Also, the political ads about the Inflation Reduction Act are going to be very prevalent. So mm -hmm. your members and all Medicare beneficiaries this year are going to know that they're going to need to take a look at their plan this year, that costs are going up, then they're going to get their ANOX. We anticipate a lot of sticker shock. So your phone will be ringing, but also having that proactive approach, like you said, to let them know that you're here to help them. And we'll talk a lot more about that too. Yeah. So then the back end of November and early December, we probably will see a lot of enrollments. It might be a slower start to the season, but at the same time, we ultimately might end up with net growth because there's so much turbulence that people are going to get, st that sticker shock is a good way to put it, yep. and they're going to want to shop. Yep. Okay, so then let's think about what the Medicare Advantage open enrollment period that first three months of the year looks like. Yeah. Let's talk about sticker shock. Yeah, absolutely, because a lot of people, as we know, don't really review their plan, even with all of the extra awareness this year. You're still going to have those that don't pay attention. They get caught up in the election, you know, the holidays roar by, and then they get into OEP. They use their plan for the first time. Perhaps now they've got a $590 deductible on their drugs, and then they're out shopping. So I think the OEP, given just the, the turbulence of the election, um, could be a really good season for us to capture those members or those that just didn't ever really find an agent during AEP. Yeah, so, you know, the, the climate in D.C. over the last couple of years has been fairly heavy regulatory. I mean, I can tell you from just going through it with all the call recording debate that we had a year or so ago and having multiple meetings with CMS and trying to help them understand what an independent agent does and the advice that they give and that they're not just kind of a 
you know, go in there and 30 minutes later get an enrollment type of thing. And I think it fell on deaf ears, a lot of it. You know, uh, the decisions were left to the regulators and not necessarily the le legislators. Crafting the bills, crafting the regulations, the courts were deferring to the regulators. Yeah. And then we have this new concept. It's not really new, but it, it, it may be to our listeners, Chevron deference or Chevron doctrine. Yep. Well, any comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. So we were all anticipating a decision from the litigation that took place. And it was a suit that really challenged the final rule and certain elements of it, specifically the compensation. It was filed here in North Texas. And Judge O'Connor did come out with an injunction a couple days after the Chevron doctrine was overturned by the Supreme Court. And we were all anticipating that the ruling from O'Connor would have come earlier, but then it all made sense when we saw the Chevron doctrine overturned because what that did is really stripped some of the power away from federal agencies like CMS and the SEC and the FDA and you know all these agencies that really try to enforce some of the legislation. There's a narrative that they, they've overreached in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in this particular case of, of the final rule, there was a lot of argument over that overreach, but the Chevron doctrine allowed these agencies to essentially interpret their own rules, and the courts had to accept those interpretations. Now they can say, well, that's not exactly what you said, and, and an example of that would be the $100 that we uh, were faced with as compensation uh, above and beyond fair market value that was going to go to agents. There was some ambiguity around that, whether or not that applied to FMOs like ourselves. And at the, at the final hour, CMS basically came out and said, yes, that that's what agents are going to be paid and that will be taken away from FMOs. And the courts were saying in their argument that that's not what you said. That interpretation wasn't exactly how it was written. And so now the courts have that power. So I think for the new final rule that comes out or the proposed rule will actually be released two months earlier. So normally we see that in November. They've announced now it's going to be released in September. And that Chevron doctrine being overturned gives us now, I think, some confidence that they're going to have to be very deliberate about what they're saying. It can't be full of ambiguity. They can't not really give clarity. And that's why that Junction went into place. And, and, you know, rightfully so, because over the past couple of years, as I've battled some of these call recording conversations, trying to explain to CMS what an FMO is, what we do, and I feel like it really fell on deaf ears. And, you know, so it's interesting how that pendulum of life just kind of keeps swinging back into balance. And perhaps I don't want to say that it was insane, but we'll, we'll gain a bit more clarity and sanity in some of these directions. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it was a big win for us. Obviously, agents not getting the hundred dollars. You know, there is some 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 disappointment around that. But we've heard, you know, some carriers will bring back the HRA, and so there's some. I think, and, and, and again, this ship I don't think has sailed uh, completely. I think we're still going to have further uh, regulation around uh, compensation, uh, and I, I know that you know there was a Plan B being developed by a lot of the carriers. It's still in the incubator, but I think now we've got a lot more time to really see how that's going to impact the industry. So mm -hmm. I don't think that um, we're, we're out of the woods just yet, but we certainly have a lot of positive things that had happened. You know, life changes so quick. I just did the AHIP less than well, a month ago, <laughs> and in part of my instruction, it showed the, the schedule for fair market value. And as I was looking at Part D, paying like $211 or something like that, I'm like, wow, this is yeah. a, certainly a sign of the times. And I don't yeah. really think they ever intended to add $100 fair market value to a PDP, maybe a yeah. MAPD, but... Yeah, with all the pressures the carriers have with PDP, how is that going to help? Exactly. You know, how is that going to help the agent or the beneficiary? How are you going to pay out $211 on a 50 cent premium? Exactly. So, you know, hopefully there'll be a little bit more common sense that comes into the equation, which kind of drags me into our next conversation. I say drag in a good way because... <laughs> Wow, this MAPD market is going to be crazy good this year. Absolutely. I see so many plan exits and different things happening out there. I mean, we've seen a couple of the carrier rollouts so far. What are your initial observations? Yeah, I think a lot of disruption, a lot of shoppers this year. Um, certainly, we're seeing more appetite for CSNP plans. Uh, with the DSNP election periods changing, you know, the, the year-round selling opportunity is no longer there. So the carriers are responding with CSNP. Uh, we also know that, 
you know, on the CSNP plans, there's going to be more improved formularies, you know, better benefits. So I think that will drive a lot of plan to plan switch. They like their, you know, Humana plan or their United plan. Now there's a CSNP in the market from that carrier. The network is generally very similar, if not the same, so they can switch over. Um, you know, I think we're also going to see a lot of plan terminations. We've already, already heard from Aetna that they're having significant plan terminations. Humana will have terminations. We know that WellCare pulled out of six states this year. Um, we also know that there's a lot of plans that are looking at the DSNIP market and saying maybe they don't want to participate because they're not an integrated plan. Uh, we heard about Kansas City Blue Cross pulling out mm -hmm. of the market. Mutual of Omaha pulled out of the PDP market. You've got um, Care and Care in the, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that pulled out. So I think you're going to see a lot of these terminations, which of course is opportunity for us all. Absolutely. We're going to get into MedSup and PDP here in a minute. Before we go there, though, I want to ask you, in your opinion, you know, with Medicare Advantage, obviously the benefits are, have just been getting better and better and better each year. In fact, one year ago, I was thinking about this last night going, wow, you know, one year ago we were talking about the surge of PPOs and uh, the aggressive Part B give backs. Oh, yeah. And we were questioning, you know, are these products sustainable? Mm -hmm. And, you know, once again, the pendulum of life kind of pulls us back into some reality. Yep. Part of that includes not just plan exits, but provider groups and certain hospitals that we start to hear that are pulling out of networks. Yep. And do you feel like this is a strong trend? Are we on shaky ground with some of these carrier agreements? Yeah, I mean, we have seen more and more large hospital and provider group negotiations with health plans than ever before and they get messy you know they get um, in the the news and the media slamming each other we've had you know just last year some hospital systems say they're done with medicare advantage so i do think that as the the price of of, of medicine is going up and these plans are demanding more from the health insurers that we're going to see more of that disruption in the marketplace so if we keep score, that might be a check mark against MAPD. Yep. But let me throw this one out, the big one, the mm -hmm. Inflation Reduction Act. Oh yeah. AKA the Inflation Creation Act. <laughs> okay, depends on how you want to look at it. Right. However, right. in this respect, this gave really a good benefit for Medicare beneficiaries. The main thing there was the two thousand dollar max out of pocket. Yep. But again, when we're looking at fifty cent, ten dollar, twenty dollar premiums. And the carriers have to make money or else they're going to pull the product. Yeah. How is this all going to work? Yeah, this is one of the hottest topics right now around standalone Part D. I mean, it obviously affects the embedded Medicare Advantage Part D as well, but not as, as, as significantly. Um, you know, going into the carrier rollouts this year, we really didn't know what to expect. We knew there was going to be a lot of disruption. What we heard is that WellCare is not going to pay a commission. Aetna is not going to pay a commission. Uh, so we're already seeing that trend of non-commissionable PDP. Cigna did come out and say they would continue to pay a commission. So it'll be a mixed bag, but I think there's going to be a lot fewer commissionable products out there. The other thing we're seeing is that there's you know a $2,000 max out of pocket now, and that max out of pocket is is not calculated the same way that it was before before it was a true out-of-pocket expense what the member paid at the pharmacy now it's based on that medicare rate of that drug so it's going to be a lot harder to calculate the MOOP. you're really going to have to rely on tools like simply enroll sunfire to calculate that MOOP and know when that person's going to hit their catastrophic level in fact i think there's a rule of thumb out there if you're taking two brand drugs you're likely to hit that catastrophic level very quick and then it doesn't really matter what PDP you're on. You just really want to go, if you're a high utilizer, for the lowest premium. Mm -hmm. And then if you throw copay smoothing on top of that, where mm -hmm. now they can break up their benefit or their, their copay throughout the year, if they get hit with a large deductible in the beginning, they can actually break that down based on the remaining month. And the plan has no liability if the member doesn't pay. So that's another huge liability on the plan. They don't know how much the smoothing will impact them negatively. So let me jump into that a little bit. Let's say, let's use electricity bills, for example. Obviously yeah. it's a lot higher in July and August than it might be in January and February. Right. Your gas bill in the North may be a lot higher in January and February, but not so much in the summer. Yep. And for people that are on a fixed income, they need to have that smoothed out a little bit, the peaks and the valleys, so that they can better budget on a monthly amount. Right. And so what I'm hearing you say in this smoothing is going to help people 
that in January might have to meet that close to $600 deductible and yeah. jump into a 25% coinsurance on some expensive injection, yeah. they're going to get really hit hard in the first quarter. Yeah. And then it might drop off a little bit after the next quarter. But tell us a little bit more about how that might work. I get that they, there's an average cost, but what I heard you say is really alarming that if the person decides not to pay the bill, then the carrier is on the hook. That's How do they exactly collect? Right. Yeah, so they I become mean, a collection agency. They, that's exactly right. But you know, like with the late enrollment penalty, that per, if you have a, a balance, you can't enroll in another plan. So there is a, an accountability measure there. But with copay smoothing, your member could walk into the pharmacy in January. They could have a six hundred dollar drug and they could break that down based on 12 payments throughout the year. So they could divide that by 12 and then they're paying basically, um, you know, what is that, a $50 roughly copay for the rest of the year. Um, but the, the, the plan would be charging them that amount and so they're getting a bill every month from their plan but there's no recourse. If they don't pay it, they have no way of not allowing them to roll into another plan uh, the following year. So it's so, a liability that the carriers have to absorb. Some plans collect the IRMA amounts. Now they have to collect copay payments that don't get paid. I mean, mm -hmm. these carriers are being asked to do a lot of things. Yep. What protections have been given to the carriers? Are they allowed to drop members? That's the, that's the kicker. There is no protection. Wow. So it's another big liability that could, in fact, impact premiums ahead if something, you know, if a measure isn't put in place to, to allow them to send them to collections or not allow them to enroll in another plan until that balance is paid. So here we're trying to absorb changes that affect us in 2025 and we're at now, we're talking about things that could impact the year of 2026. Yep. You know, bad debt. Yep. You know, it's just got to be built into the premium. So once again, cost shifting. And to make matters even worse, you know, we're here in early August and just yesterday we were told that there's going to be premium stabilization demonstration project from CMS, which we won't get too in the weeds on that. In fact, on August the 6th, we're going to have a whole webinar on Part D so you can really understand the mechanics behind everything that's changing. But they basically said, we recognize now that the average premium for a PDP that was filed by the carriers is $179.45. That's up from just over $60 last year. So we've had a huge increase, over $100 increase in what plans are filing for pre premiums for PDPs. And that could equal, once you back out the, the subsidy from CMS, we could be looking at triple digit, you know, 100 plus premiums as an average across the board for a standalone Part D. So CMS has hit the panic button here and said, we're gonna allow plans to enter this demonstration project now where they can receive additional subsidies essentially from the government to drive that premium down and keep it more in the line with what we've seen, you know, in this year, you know, maybe that 50, $60 range. But I can tell you that in talking with some carriers, they're already saying that that may not be the right path. Don't think that you're still not going to see very high PD pre P premiums. I think oh, we're yeah. going to see, you know, probably close to triple digit premiums across the board. I might be going out on a ledge here, but I'm going to also suggest Big Pharma is still going to make a huge profit. <laughs> you know, somehow they're going to get paid. Aren't oh, they? absolutely. You know, and that's, you know, we could go into a whole other thing about drug negotiation and what pharma is doing. You know, Eliquis, one of the, the, mm -hmm. the major brand name drugs goes into negotiations next year. So what will happen there? Will pharma just jack up the price? to then, you know, not have it negotiated down as, as low as it could be. That could be, you know, a game that they play to keep those costs, you know, relatively we'll Come high. up with Eloquist 2.0. <laughs> yeah. You know, new and improved, right? That's right, exactly. Uh, well, so the, we've talked a little bit about Medicare Advantage. Mm -hmm. Now we've kind of rolled that up into how the Inflation Reduction Act is going to help or not help Part D premiums and, and Medicare beneficiaries. And then let's talk about MedSup. Yeah. So let's put these all on the table. MAPD, PDP, MedSup. You're an independent agent. You're out there advising a Medicare beneficiary. What's going to be the best? Yeah. You know, just in the last two or three months, 
we've seen major, major companies taking north of 10% rate increases on med subs. Yeah. And for all the other smaller mid-level companies, and we have a lot of good A-rated carriers out there, they're looking at this as, well, hey, you know, we can sw we can cruise into the wake yeah. and throw our 10% rate. You you get a major rate increase correction, if you want to call that, with MedSup. And then you also have all these new PDP premiums that are going to be much higher. Right. Now all of a sudden, someone who was paying two hundred dollars for their MAP or for their MedSup and PDP, now they may be paying three hundred dollars. What do you think is going to be the reaction? MAPD zero dollar premium. You know, I think it's another tailwind for MAPD because, as you mentioned, you got double digit rate increases on your MedSup for most carriers across the board, which is unprecedented, right? A lot of the carriers have touted single digit increases for years, and then you have your you know, standalone Part D potentially going up significantly, and, and not to mention the cost shares on those going up to more co-insurances, you know, higher co-pays, et cetera. So that med sup and, and standalone Part D member is seeing significant increase across the board. Perhaps they've looked at Medicare Advantage in the past, or their doctor, you know, may have become more friendly with it over the years, and now it's that breaking point where they're going to take a serious look at it. So I think you're going to see a lot of that this year. Mm. A lot of, even though MA is taking some funding hits, they're actually getting positive rebates right now and putting more dollars into benefits. So I think when MAs actually come out and we're projecting in the next couple of weeks, they'll kind of all have their be their full benefits out there. Some of it's mm -hmm. just, you know, partial kind of plan benefit designs that are released now. But I think once that comes out, we're going to see MA is still a very, very strong competitive product out there. And a lot of that med sub business, I think, could f eventually just make that decision. If prices continue to mm -hmm. rise, you know, eventually they just get to the point where they want to go on a, a zero premium plan. You know, as I'm listening to your comments, I'm thinking to myself how some things never change, and for the past 25 or so years, as this Medicare Advantage world has exploded, the old unofficial slogan, zero is hero. Mm -hmm. Zero dollar premium is still the hero out there. Yep. So now I'm going to parlay that thought with something you said earlier about the first part of October mm -hmm. and having to really have a strong retention play in your book of business. Yep. If I'm a Medicare beneficiary and I'm getting notified of all these different changes and now I'm looking at um, 50 cent and $10 PDP premiums that are going up to 40 or 50 or $100, whatever they may be, right. or a lot more, and it's going to hit my monthly budget, I'm going to start looking at that $0 monthly premium, which is great that we have these options. But I'm thinking of the uh, through the eyes of a broker. I need to probably protect that beneficiary that they're going to use me to do that MAPD enrollment okay. and not necessarily the celebrity on the TV. So any advice that we could give our brokers there? This is the year where you, you have to have your book of business in a CRM or at least in an Excel spreadsheet to where you can contact them, you can get in front of those members early. Um, like you said, make sure they know you're there to help them navigate that. And then I think as an agent, you know, you have to look at what's best for your member. Keep in mind, if you move them off of a MedSup onto an MA, they've got the one-year free look, the trial period. So mm -hmm. they can then go back guaranteed issue you on to a, a med sub that might be a good way to, to say hey here try it out you know these plans are getting really expensive these plans have really been you know medicare advantage has been growing their networks adding a lot more benefits it's a much more mature product than maybe it was when you first enrolled in that med sub that's a great point um and then and then i also think for those that are looking at plan terminations recognize that if your members are losing their medicare advantage plan they have guaranteed issue now into a medicare supplement and maybe there's that member out there that couldn't qualify for underwriting purposes, but now they could. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've uh, maybe had a history of cancer or heart disease, or they've, you know, had some major illness and they want that fixed cost. I think that is one avenue for MedSup to see a little bit of a lift, mm -hmm. right? Now, again, not a lot of carriers pay a full commission on guaranteed issue, but there are a few that do. Mm -hmm. Blue Cross uh, of, of Texas is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think agents just need to be kind of aware of those nuances and, and guide members of Appropriately. You're so right. And, and to be aware, I think, is let's just take that phrase and it means so much because in this business, what I have discovered is the people that stay on top of the trends, that stay sharp, that educate themselves on these things that we're talking about, those are the ones that will ultimately be the winners. Yep. And then something else that you just said about a CRM. 
And you mentioned also earlier Sunfire Matrix. And here at the brokerage, you know, we've championed technology as a solution for a very long time. Yep. And it seems like now more than ever, an agent is going to have to really invest in technology. Yeah. You got absolutely. a couple of pieces of advice for people out there? Yeah. So we've got some exciting enhancements coming as part of our Simply Enroll tool this year. One of the one of the, 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 I think the most time consuming thing sometimes for an agent can be collecting those drugs and getting mm -hmm. all that information updated. So we have a unique um, Pearl or an individual URL that's personalized for each agent that they're going to be able to send out via text, email, or a QR code to their members. And th those members can then update their drugs. That'll push right into Simply Enroll so they can quickly run a, a quote and get it to that member. Even if it's a new prospect, that, that will, will, information will load into Sunfire. So a lot more to come with that. In addition, and I'm going to be rolling this out on August the 8th, but we're going to have a new member uh, retention program where we're going to mail all of our agents book a business this year. We're going to have templates available for them in our portal. They'll be able to upload their book and get in front of their members early, promote their QR code with Simply Enroll, promote uh, you know, their Calendly link if they want, so a personalized letter. They can even upload their own letter of choice. So more to come on that, but we're real excited about being able to do that for our agents this year. So we have so many things that we talked about here this morning. So let me try to put a ribbon <laughs> around some of the turbulence here. Yeah. Because again, we started out by saying turbulence breeds opportunity. Yeah. Opportunity means more enrollments. So taking all these things that we just talked about, the changes within the MAPD market, the okay. changes with the PDP market, the possible rate increases with the MedSup markets, all of the different regulations, the fair market value, and all the things, the noise yeah. could probably deter an agent and keep their eye off of the ball, so to speak. Uh, I get a lot of questions, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to survive? Mm -hmm. But what I hear you saying is we're not just going to survive, but we're going to thrive. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think this will be the biggest AEP uh, we've seen in years just because more and more consumers are going to want to talk to an agent. This is the year where you want to be in retail. You want to be out, you know, in your HEB or Walmart. Uh, in fact, we're about to roll out the Walmart program here in just a couple of days. So agents will have an opportunity to take advantage of that. Um, if you're doing seminars, invite your members. Make sure that you get in front of all your members, whatever that strategy is, but make sure that you can tackle your current book of business early because there's a ton of shopping out there and a ton of people that are going to be looking at Medicare Advantage for the very first time or looking to see if they've got the right plan. Well, so to close out, I would say that the, I hope our message this morning today has been one of hope hope and change, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that's probably the real answer. Take that turbulence and put it into your own energy and use that to pull vault into new sales, new enrollments, new referral opportunities. Yeah. And doing it with a company like the brokerage is probably in their best interest. Yeah, we're constantly trying to think of ways to help the agent. You know, member retention has been a growing concern but it'll even grow more. Once we get to 2030, the majority of the members we serve will be 75 to 85. The boomers have aged out. So then it's really focused on retention. Carriers are gonna keep putting in these side-by-side -side plans where here's a new plan in the market that just looks a little bit more attractive and you wanna make sure you're there to guide your members on it. So having the right technology, that's really what we're focused on, helping agents really you know, retain that membership, but also being able to go get new membership as well. And true to our our history and the roots of this company have the vision not only for the for the future but also the intelligence to deal with the right now and to help our agents retain members and grow their book business absolutely that's exactly right I'll put a wrap on that all right <laughs> thank you always good talking to you thanks thanks Mike